You're listening to Storage Nerds Podcast, where we unravel the best kept secret of the real estate investing world, the storage industry. Join the grassroots guru in self-storage, Stacy Rossetti, in insightful discussions about finding, funding, and running these spaces, allowing you to yield the highest returns possible. Get your foot in the door on self-storage and discover how to properly purchase facilities, negotiate with sellers, and close the deal without worries. Start unpacking that investment wisdom with Stacy right now. Hello. Everybody's, everybody's hopping on. All right. Good to see everybody. Good to thank you for coming. I got a good topic today. For now, I'm just in my uh, bedroom and uh, we're trying to get settled. We just bought a house and it's just like, you know, we lived in an RV for a year. And before the RV, we lived in a tiny house. Yeah, I lived, we lived in a tiny house for like three years and then we lived in an RV and uh, we traveled for most of that time. So that's why we lived in a tiny house. And um, and so we got rid of everything that we owned, like everything. So now we now we just moved into this like huge house. It's like 4,000 square feet, this house. And uh, so we have like no furniture, nothing. So I'm like slowly, like we bought a bed this whole weekend. I was doing nothing but just like putting stuff together. It was horrible, actually. It was like horrible. I put a dresser together. I put like, wait, one, two. I put two dressers together. And I, um, let's see what else. I put so much stuff together. I can't even remember anymore. And Pete is actually, Pete's my husband for everybody that doesn't know. Pete is uh, gone. He's, he's gone. It was He's gone all last week and he's gone this week. And he's trying to like, you know, work on some of our storage facilities and like get them because we're going to be gone into in New York for a couple of weeks to, just to hang out with family for the holidays and stuff. And um, so it's just me and I'm just sitting here like putting all this furniture together and taking care of Lillian. So if she if she comes in at any time, I apologize, but it's just me. So he can't watch her uh, during this session. But um, yeah, I'm like tired. My back is hurting from like sitting on the ground and putting like dressers together. I was up like late every single night doing it. And, um, you know, I'm not understanding the whole concept of like sending you like a, like a piece of furniture and having you put that together. Like, why can't you just get the whole thing together? I'm not understanding. So, so that's kind of my life right now. Just buying furniture and putting putting it together. Uh, so we still don't even have like a dining room table or couch or anything like that. The only thing that we have to sit on is like my bed. So it's been very interesting. Okay. So, uh, everybody's introducing themselves. I see, I see you guys are all introducing yourself. I appreciate, I appreciate that. And I appreciate you all coming and listening to me. I'm going to talk about something like super important today. Actually, I don't know. It's, it's like super exciting to me is, uh, I'm going to talk about like the, and I've seen this with my students is the difference between like primary, secondary, and tertiary markets. And I kind of just want to get into that today and talk about it and kind of talk about the markets and how everything is changing, okay? And uh, so like, you know, because when I got into self-storage investing in 2016, you know, prices were a lot cheaper and, um the primary, secondary, and tertiary markets, we're going to talk about that. And then we're going to talk about how the market has changed from like when I got into the business in 2016 until now. And kind of just, I'm going to show you today how you can tell the difference. Because I've noticed when I talk to people that they really don't know the difference between those three markets and really kind of how to tell, you know. So I think we would just kind of spend the day on that today. And uh, just go over that. And in the meantime, if you have any other questions or anything, just pop them into the chat. And if I have time, I'll try to answer those. And again, if you have bought a storage facility uh, or if you're, um, you know, uh, if you're like, if you're already a person that owns storage, then uh, welcome. And if you have not owned any storage and you're looking to buy a storage facility, you are in the right place. Um, because that's what I do is I teach people how to buy storage facilities. And we have uh, we have 11 of our own, and then we have two in our fund, the Self Storage Fund of America. And we're in the process of buying, uh, well, so it's so funny. It's so funny because I made an offer on a facility 
gosh, it's been like almost two, three months ago. I got it under contract for one point. It was, well, it, I made an offer for, for $1.9 million. And then, um, and that's actually the most expensive like storage facility that I've ever bought. So everybody, you guys all know that I'm like secondary and tertiary market. So I'm used to like just smaller facilities. So this is a $1.9 million facility. And uh, and then as we started to do due diligence and really kind of look at his numbers and things like this, you know, then we uh, we started to um, we 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 changed our offer to one point seven million. And he said um, he said, OK, to that So we put it under contract for one point seven million dollars. And uh, and now, uh, like after we've been there and we've had like 60 days to really kind of dig deep into like this facility and look at like economic occupancy versus physical occupancy and look at CapEx and all this stuff, then we realized that the facility is really only worth $1.4 million. And so we came back to the owner and we told the owner that we wanted to change our offer. I said, look, I know like, I know it's gonna piss you off, but like the only thing that, um, you know, the only price that we could pay is like $1.4 million. I mean, it's just not like, you know, I've talked to my investors, we've looked at like financing it and 1.4 is kind of just where everybody wants to be. And that's where we want to be. And that's where kind of we feel comfortable. And he was, of course, pissed. And I would be pissed too, you know, because like, that's like $300,000. That's just gone. And so um, we just, so I let him like, I kind of just talked to him and then I let him, you know, think about it and stuff. And that was like, maybe that was last week sometime. I, actually, he didn't talk to me for like a whole week. I thought like, oh, like maybe a week or two. Yeah, I told him like, yeah. So right after we got back from the holidays, I told him and he didn't talk to me. He was like pissed. And, um, so then he came back, he just came back today and he messaged me. He said, okay, if you can do 1.425, then you can take the facility. He said, I talked to my wife. He said, so let's hop on zoom and let's like discuss this. But he's like, I want to just finalize it. So, so we went from 1.9 to 1.7 to 1.4 on this facility. And the, and the facility is actually a great facility. It's worth like 3.3 to 3.4 million dollars. But um it just it's like it's got it's the 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 the, the physical occupancy versus the economic occupancy is like not good honestly and um and then the there's like a there's like a warehouse and on the facility, on the property, there's like a warehouse that he kind of rents out like a whole bunch of different unit, like uh, six different like spaces. And um, he's not making what he should be making. And also the people that are there are like, just like ruining that whole place and stuff. So it's going to take that building itself is going to take like a lot of work. So it's a storage facility plus like a warehouse. And I really want to make that warehouse into, into um, climate control. And, uh, but I didn't put that in like the numbers or anything. Cause like when I look at numbers, I typically look at numbers like, like, what is it right now? What could it be doing right now? Not like, what if I added more spaces? Now, some people, they love developing. I mean, some people, they look at, they look at property and they say, look, I can, you know, I could definitely add, you know, more space. I want more space. And actually I have a whole handful of students that I'm doing like turnkey acquisitions for. And they're adamant, like, I want, I want like a facility plus land and, you know, cause they want to add on and stuff, you know, but, um, we just really aren't like those type of people. We like to like buy, fix up, stabilize, and then just sell. In fact, the first four facilities that we bought, we're going to be selling in January. We're going to list those out and, uh, we're going to, we're going to list those. And, uh, I'm looking forward to selling those because, you know, not only am I going to make some money on them, but also I get to go through that process because I've never sold a, a a storage facility before. You know, so all of the facilities we've had, we just we've been holding on to them for you know for the for the last couple of years. So I'm kind of excited to go through that process. And like, you know, who knows where the market's going to be? And I talked about this last time. Where's the market going to be? And like when we list the property in January, and it's going to take us like, you know, three to six months to, to sell the things. I will be listing my properties at 20% what everybody else, 20% lower what everybody else is listing them at. <clears throat> so people might think, oh, wow, that's a lot of money, 20% lower. But the truth is, is that 
you know, when you get into this business and you really figure this business out, I mean, to buy a storage facility is like not a big deal. You know, I mean, to buy a storage facility and hold on to it for a couple of years and then sell it and then just go buy another storage facility for me, that's just, that's my protocol. That's, that's how I work. That's how me and Pete work. And that's just kind of, that's just kind of our system. So for me to, you know, I don't have to make top dollar on every single one of my facilities. I'm not going to hold on to my facilities until like I get the highest point or whatever, because I know that I could just like take that money. In fact, what's going to happen is that like, I have like a million dollars in those four properties from private lenders and we'll sell it for about $3 million. And that million dollars from those private lenders, essentially they don't want that money back. You know, they don't want that money back. So I'll be able to roll that money right into uh, to some, you know, to some deals. And on top of that, I'll be able to take my money that I have and put those into other deals. So for me to sit there and really push the numbers on like 3.3, 3.5 or whatever, like, you know, cause it could get that much. Then I just really, I, I just rather just sell those suckers and just like roll that money into more stuff and just keep moving on is what I'd be. I, that's kind of my personality. But I have a lot of students, you know, and there's nothing wrong with this as well, too. Like they have a number in their head and this is exactly how sellers are, too. Right. They've got this number in their head and they're going to hold on to that number, especially if you only have one storage facility. Right. Especially if you just have that one storage facility, you're like, I've got to make as much money as I possibly can on this on this property. So, um, you know, just keep that in mind, of course, from the seller's point of view, sometimes when they only have one property, that's their retirement. That's like, you know, that's their life. There's a lots of livelihood, you know, so they want to like penny pinch and get as much as they can. But the truth is, is you really should be in that you should get yourself into the position where it's like, you know, have a couple of these things or more than a couple. And then that way you can just, you know, rinse and repeat. You can just sell and just keep moving on. All right, so that's kind of where I'm at. We're about to go through the liquidation process. And I talked about this last week. We're gonna sit with our, we're sitting with our, our CPA. We had to be meeting with CPAs last uh, last week. And I'm trying to figure out like taxes and selling properties and what's gonna happen and like tax sheltering and this kind of stuff is where we're at. Uh, so I'm really excited about 2023. It's going to be good. I'm going to be prepared for 2023. Now, for everybody that's new in this industry, you guys all want to get in. Essentially, last time, so I got into the real estate industry in uh, 2010, like 2011, which was like the perfect time to get in because I was coming in an upswing, right? It was from the downswing to the upswing. And this, th and this time is when I was doing like, I was doing rehabs. And it was a great time to do rehabs because everything was super cheap and you could buy, you know, discounted prices and stuff like that. But, um, you know, and so I was in this upswing. So actually the truth is, is I've really honestly never been through a downswing. I got in in 2010, 2011, and it's just been an upswing because this is like one of the lo longest markets, you know, uh, markets that it's been going upwards, right? So we're finally about, you know, supposedly we're going down now. So I'm excited to go through a downswing. And the good thing is that I've been through this cycle. I've been through the, the one, the half of a cycle to where I know and I was educated to like prepare for the down cycle, you see what I'm saying? So I, I'm, I'm prepared and ready. So just for all the newbies out there, you may get, you may be started in, um, and maybe just getting started and maybe you're not in the same position that I, as I'm in, but the truth is, is that you're in a cycle, learn that cycle and learn how to navigate that cycle. Cause I've learned over the past 10 years or 12 years that I've been doing this is that real estate is just nothing but a cycle. And every, you know, every couple of years it shifts into something else. And um, because I was like, it was like, it was like rehabbing. And then all of a sudden it was like, it was like multifamily was awesome. And then it was like commercial real estate started building up. And then industrial was a main now everybody's industrial and storage. And now we're coming into the downturn. Right. And so what's going to be important? Buy and holds, right? And creative deal structuring, owner financing. Because the reason why is because banks are so conservative. 
right? Banks are so conservative right now, ridiculous. Like it's going to be like, did the numbers come out or is that tomorrow? I can't remember. I haven't looked at the news all day because I've been busy. But if anybody, if, if it came out yesterday or is it, when's the meeting, today or tomorrow? But um, so, you know, if it goes up half a point or, you know, 75 basis points or whatever, I mean, it's going to be at 8%. I'm telling my students right now to run their numbers at like 8 to 8.5%. So if you're going to close on a property within the next 90 to 120 days, you're probably going to be in the 8% mark, right? Banks are being super conservative, you know, all this kind of stuff. So that's just, just, just a, it's just a cycle. It's going to last for a couple of years and then you're going to go into something else, right, is what it is. So just kind of like, be strong, be smart, educate yourself, surround yourself with people that you want to become, keep moving forward, keep taking action, talk to as many owners as you possibly can, make as many offers as, as you possibly can. And, uh, you know, and then you'll just educate yourself along the way and you'll find a couple of good deals, right? And just, I mean, I've only been doing this in storage. I've only been doing this now since 2017. I started looking in 2016 and, and bought our first facility in 2017. And, you know, and I'm already like, you know, five years in and we're, we're already like this. And the reason why is because I keep moving forward. I have momentum. I take action. You know, and uh, even when I screw up, believe me, I screw up, you know, I screw up. I mean, I had a rehab. That was a bad rehab. A lot. Of, I lost a lot of money on that rehab. That kind of set me back for a couple of years, you know, but I just kept pushing forward and moving forward. And I had a goal of one storage facility a year. And that's why I tell my students, one facility a year is a very good goal to have. Now, obviously, as you keep getting into this, Right. And after the first and second and third years of you doing this, all of a sudden it just gets easier and easier, you know, but one facility a year. That's a great. That's a great goal. If you guys have any goals about real, real estate investing for 2023, or if you have any goals for storage investing, I would love for you to put those into the chat so I could read those uh, and really just put them out into the world. So the world like hears them and manifest them for you. You know, it's important to be, you know, to tell, you know, to tell people about what your goals are, because then really what it does is kind of holds you accountable. And so that's why I'm really an open book. Honestly, I'm telling you guys what I'm doing. Well, that means I have to do it if I'm telling you what I'm doing, right? You know, because I'm out in the world. So I'd love to hear what your goals are for this next year coming up. Everybody should be planning them. I start planning my 2023 in October. And um, so uh, that's kind of where I'm at, right? just to give everybody purchase good. And Rachel says she wants to purchase her first facility in 2023. Perfect. See, that's a very good goal. Just keep your eye on that goal. Keep coming to the Monday night sessions and uh, I'll be, you know, I'll be there to at least kind of educate you. I'm here every Monday night, except for I will not be here uh, on the Monday after Christmas and the Monday after New Year's. I'm going to take two weeks off and because I'm traveling and with family and all this kind of stuff or whatever. So just so you know, so next Monday I'll be here, which is the 19th. And then after that, I'm going to take the the, uh, the 26th and the second off. Now, just a quick reminder. Um, I like Ido. Ido said I want uh, I want to purchase my first facility before summer 23. Good. I want or I will. I like that. Say I will. That's a good one. So, and the doors to storage nerds, the coaching program, uh, and the mastermind open up in uh january january 8th so make sure that you get on the wait list at storagenerds.com and so that way if you are interested in getting coaching then you can get notified to uh, to talk to me about it i only take about 20 students or so so about 20 students is kind of where i'm at so just fyi so you want to get on the wait list and discuss it with me and then um see if it's a good fit for you okay now let's move on to the um Let's move on to Google Maps. Okay, um, who else? Let's see. Rachel says that we're gonna we're scheduled to meet. Good. I'd like to buy my first storage facility. I want to buy my first storage facility next year. That's it. Those are y'all are the only like people that have goals. Nobody else has a goal for next year. Okay, that's good to know. Um, uh, so let's see. Let's try to have a goal for next year. I think one one storage facility is a good goal if that's what you're um, if you're interested in storage. Now, um, 
good. Other people are doing a thank you, Ariel, and says, okay, so Cynthia says she's got to have her own storage facility, and Jim is going to buy one in New Hampshire and maybe another one in, in North Carolina. Good. I love it. So, um, so yeah, let me share my screen, and I just want to get into um, – the, well, let me just say the uh, the difference between primary, secondary, and tertiary markets, okay? And uh, so primary market is like just, you know, is like metro cities, all right? So Atlanta, Nashville, San Diego, Los Angeles, Phoenix, obviously those are, these are all primary markets, OK, and in the industry, you have uh, like in the commercial industry, you have like primary, secondary and tertiary. So primary is really that the city, right, the big cities, but actually even smaller cities, like even smaller cities. So, for instance, I live in Tallahassee, which has only 200,000 people in it, but it does have a primary market. And the primary market, uh, the primary market is. um and when you go to like a primary market and you search storage, you will see like cube smarts and extra spaces and life storage and um, public storage and whatever it is. You'll see these like funds or these like kind of huge big box companies. That's so you know that you're in a primary market if you see those, right? Now the question is, that's the easy one. The primary market. We know like all these big cities are primary market. Now the question is like, what, what are secondary markets and what are tertiary markets? So let's get into that since we kind of know what a primary market is. And let me share my screen and I want to just talk about this. And then if you have any questions about any areas that you're looking at, then we could always try to figure that, put it into the chat as well. So um, everybody should be able to see my um, my Google Maps, all right? And uh, so, okay, let me see here. So this is, where am I? Okay, so you, I said I'm in Tallahassee, okay? And um, so you can see in Tallahassee, uh, this is, and population is very important. I said this is 200,000 people that live in Tallahassee. But you want to get into your Google Maps and you just want to search the word storage. Wherever you're at, just search the word storage, okay? And so you can see here, right? You can see, uh-oh, and uh, you can see the uh, all of the big, um, all the big, X, come on, let's, let's X out of this for a second. Okay, so all the big box companies, okay? So you could see Cube Smarts, you could see, um, Storage Quest, Storage King, Otter, Storage Prime Storage, Extra Space. There's an Extra Space Storage. There's one. There's a couple of Cube Smarts. There's Prime Storage. These are all kind of like bigger ones. Storage King. And when you look at these facilities, right, you can kind of tell me they're all indoor, huge outdoor kind of spaces. Cube Smarts. You know, so we all we all know these are going to be like primary market. Okay. One thing that I one thing that I want you to notice when you start looking in your city is, and obviously these facilities here are like you know going to be three, four, five, ten million dollars. These facilities, I mean, these facilities are huge, big facilities. Okay, now this one right here, this Cube Smart, because I drive by this Cube Smart every day to drop Lillian off at school, and um. This one here, uh, if you click on it, let's see. It's a Cube Smart. And let me see if it has any pictures, like actual pictures. Yeah, this is it. Yeah, it looks really nice. I don't think it looks this nice, honestly. But yeah, so you could see what it looks like. It's outdoor storage and indoor storage. On the outside, it looks really kind of beat up, honestly. They're making these pictures look really good. They must have like professional photographer come in and take a look at it. But I think what happens, I think what happened on this facility is that um, Cube Smart is managing this facility. So, right. So there's different types of facilities as well, too. There's um, like they like Cube Smart or Extra Space or Public Storage will come in and build a facility. Right. And then also they manage them as well, too, especially CubeSmart. They do a lot of managing of other people's facilities. So I'm guessing for like this CubeSmart, because also another thing is like where this location is, 
this is not like in Tallahassee. So the way Tallahassee is, is like this big circle right here. This is like Tallahassee. Like, and this right here, I would consider this to be like, I would consider this to be country actually. It's kind of out in the middle of nowhere. But this Cube Smart is there. And so that just makes me believe that Cube Smart is um is managing this facility as well, right? So you can always just kind of notice that. Here's a Bradford mini storage. What's this like way out here? Yeah, so this is this one. And uh, this is a nice big facility, it looks like. Lots of, yeah, looks a little bit older, but not too bad. And uh, this one is Morningstar. No pictures, okay. And uh, so, you know, really kind of familiarize yourself with like what a primary market looks like. This is what a primary market looks like. And so now secondary market, when I pull out like into the panhandle of, uh, you know, the panhandle, obviously this area is going to be all tertiary. So where is the secondary market? Okay. And I would consider this to be like a primary market and maybe, maybe, maybe CubeSmart to be a secondary market kind of outside, but maybe, but maybe a primary market. And then anything outside of this area is really, honestly, I would consider it to be like tertiary market, okay? So this actually does not have a secondary market. I, I don't think Tallahassee has a secondary market. Now, Valdosta, we own a facility in Valdosta and Valdosta has 75,000 people. And Valdosta is definitely a secondary market. It's a standalone city not connected to any other cities that, um, you know, is like a good size. I mean, there's 75,000 people here. So in your state, maybe try to think of, um, you know, some areas that, you know, some cities that might have this. So now in a secondary market, you are going to notice that the players are different. The players are different. So, for instance, 10 Federal Storage is, is, a, uh, is a fund that buys facilities not in primary markets, but in secondary markets. They buy facilities in smaller markets, and then they, like, fix them up and make them look really nice, and then they manage them, okay? And, uh, and then, uh, so... You know, so I just noticed that in a secondary market, the players are going to be different than in a uh, primary market. OK, so primary market is going to be like hedge funds and big box, huge companies and stuff. And secondary market is going to be like medium. Now, let's click on this. Uh, let's click on this one right here. Yeah. And their their colors are always red and tan, I guess, is what it is. So this is theirs. Let's see if we can look at this. Yeah. So this is, yeah, this is their color. They usually, they come in, they paint their facilities the same color every single time. And, um, and then they, uh, they also do like a whole bunch of, I guess, technology. It's pretty cool that you can just kind of like walk through the storage facility, huh? I'm like, so what it looks like. Okay, yeah, so they, I'm trying to see if they can, we can get them up to the, if there's like off, yeah, here's the office in the front, let me see, does it let us go out or no? Yeah, here's the office in the front, there's always an office, it's got a nice gate, they paint it red and white, and then inside you can go in and they have like a kiosk. And then you can like rent your space there. So there's no person that mans this. Whereas like in a primary market, a lot of the times you'll have like somebody there manning the uh, the facility. Once you get into like se like secondary markets, a lot of the times you just, it's really remotely like, you know, remote uh, managed, okay? And, uh, you know, and then you have a lot of, in secondary markets, you have a lot of like, storage facilities that are bigger but they're not like they're they're owned by like one person or two people now obviously 10 federal is here twice but then you have like a uh, let's see a and m let's see a and m self-storage what does this one look like it's looking pretty rough there uh, this is what a unit looks like so this is it yeah so this is the storage facility so you can see it's kind of a bigger one because it's got this office and it's got like you know um 
the um like the office and then like you know the back in the back it's got it so it's like commercial maybe this is commercial rec- oh no this is this is what it looks like yeah so it's kind of a bigger facility but it's probably owned by one person or maybe you know like he owns a couple of them and that's it okay so this is what like a typical like secondary market would be now also in these types of cities these are good to look for facilities that are like they have not been bought yet by like the bigger players now i don't know let's look at bill's self-storage here look here's bill's self-storage and this one's looking pretty good here right so he's got a little uh chart here with his prices and stuff I don't think you ever really, you don't want to ever put your prices on a sign, okay? Because your prices your prices should be dynamic. Your prices are up and down with the market, all right? So this, you know this guy. So I'd be talking to Bill and, um, you know, seeing, seeing if he, you know, wants to sell. Looks like it's a little bit, like maybe it's a little bit newer. It's kind of down south, so maybe he added this. Look, oh, you can pay here with your phone. Use auto dial phone to call. It's good to like look at the pictures so you can see, man, you could just call them and they could just pay for you right here. Or you could put it right, in, you could put the money right into your slot. So this kind of like, yeah, this is definitely an older facility if he's running it like that. And let me see. So this is it. That's it. And that's all the pictures. So, so this is a very good one, I think, to try to call and talk the owner and see if, you know, if he wants to sell. And these are these, I'm telling you, this, this type of a secondary market is a great, great area to be looking in, especially right now. And uh, just talking to owners and seeing if they want to sell. Now, you know, a lot of them are going to say, no, they don't want to sell, but you know, at least you can just introduce yourself. So think about in your area, some secondary markets, all right? Now, population is super important, okay, in storage. And um, so you want to just, you want to search population by um, by state, okay? And then you want to, sorry, not population by state, population by city in, let's say, Georgia, okay? And then you're going to go to the uh, to the list and then you're going to, you know, really start looking at like po the, the, the population and seeing like what it is. Let me see. Where's Valdosta? Here's Valdosta. Valdosta has 55,000 people in it. You see, it's like interesting to look at the population because look, Atlanta has 514,000. Columbus is 210. Augusta, 200. So these are probably going to be like... Um, primary markets. I say a primary market is a hundred thousand or more, but you know, yeah, I would say primary markets like a hundred thousand or more. All right. So Sandy Springs is 110, Athens 130, you know, Roswell, these are all kind of like, now these are, uh, these are um, secondary markets, but I mean, honestly, the truth is if you look at Atlanta and, uh, you know, you look at Sandy Springs, these are, this is really just Metro Atlanta. I mean, honestly, Metro Atlanta is just massive. It's just, just two things. So I would say Alpharetta, you know, at, and Ackworth and Marietta. So these are not inside the city of Atlanta, but they're suburbs of Atlanta. So they're really in the Atlanta market. And honestly, this whole area, I would say from like Cartersville to, to Cumming, Flowery Branch, and then, you know, all the way down here is kind of like primary market, right? Primary market. So I would not like, unless you can afford millions and millions of dollars, I would not be looking at the suburbs of the city that you live in or this, you know, actually the city. So if you're living in any city, it doesn't matter, um, uh, you know, uh, Knoxville or Greensboro or whatever it is, like in the suburbs as well, like outside of like, so for instance, Charlotte here, you know, um, like I've, I've been all up in this area driving for storage and, you know, Gastonia, I would consider a primary market. You know, it's kind of further away, but it's, I've driven all this, all this area right in here is all primary market. Uh, and even though it's not in the main metro city area, it's primary market, okay? So secondary market to me is a standalone city, a standalone city of 100,000 people or less, okay? So for instance, when we get into um, 
like Augusta is 200,000 people. And then Macon, we just bought a facility in Macon. And uh, so that one is like a hundred, that's like, I, I guess that'd be considered like a, like a second, a primary to secondary market. And also another thing that I would like for you guys to consider is just what I call like, yeah, so secondary market and then maybe sub-secondary markets, right? So this is like, if you were in this metro area here, where on the outskirts of this area is like this city moving to? that you could possibly look at to purchase in, right? So um, I don't know the direction of where Charlotte's moving to, but I've driven from Charlotte to uh, Columbia, Columbia. And I really, honestly, I feel like this area in between, is like a great area to invest in. And it's expensive all the way. I mean, it gets really expensive. And then we we looked at storage facilities all in this area, you know, but I feel like this would be a sub secondary market because it's in between Columbia and Charlotte. Right. So even though it's kind of tertiary and you're going through the country, you know, uh, I feel like, you know, uh, you know, I feel like it's kind of like a little bit more expensive in this area. OK, so these are uh, and Columbia as well, too, is I mean, it would be considered I don't know what the population of Columbia is. Let's look at that population of Columbia, South Carolina as one hundred and thirty seven thousand people. All right. So I would consider that to be like a primary market. I'm sure it is. Let's look at let's see. Let's look at storage. Columbia, South Carolina. OK. So yeah, you can see extra space, live storage. It's all primary market is where this is. It's all primary market. Let's search this area again, see what else comes up. Yeah, so all primary market. Now, I don't know which way Columbia is moving, but I'm guessing Blythewood, it would be considered like a secondary market, but like it's, uh, you know, a secondary market that might be, let's see, let's, let's zoom in a little bit. And actually Google Maps is like, Google Maps or Google Earth is like the best. See, this public storage is all the way up here. So obviously it's moving up. I'm Yeah, I feel like it's gonna be moving up this way. Like, I feel like if you wanna invest in some land, I feel like in between Charlotte and Columbia is a great, a great place to invest in some land and to build storage. And uh, let's see what else. Um, and then Columbia to Augusta, you see, like it's the same kind of concept, right? This is going to be like a like a secondary to sub secondary uh, market. I call I'm gonna I'm calling them sub secondaries. It's like not a secondary market, but it will eventually become a secondary market. I feel like this area is going to be growing. A lot of pop, a lot of people are going to be, you know, a lot of stuff is going to be built in between these two towns because Augusta. I don't know if you guys saw this, but but Augusta is on the top ten cities to uh, to buy real estate in right now, uh, according to Realtor, like Realtor.com or something. I just read that. I don't know if anybody else read that. And uh, so I thought that was very interesting. This is a very, very fast growing area. And Columbia is a great area to invest in. You know, so in between here, I think would be a good area to be investing if you have a little bit more money. Okay. All right. So just think about that. You could see, you could see, you know, Charleston obviously is a huge metro area. And then outside here would be like your secondary market. And so now tertiary market. Tertiary market is like if you don't have a lot, a lot of money and you want to buy a storage facility, it's the country. That's what tertiary market is. And that's where you should be looking at. And uh, so what I would do is it just try to pick the area that you want to be in. So let's just say that we was like, OK, we are in the Augusta area. All right. And I think Augusta is kind of moving up into in, up into this area as well, too. Yeah, Evans, I think, is like a super popular area. I think that's like the nicer area. But um, let's see. Let's look at Aiken and let's look at like this. This would be a, a very good corridor. Let's see. What's the population of Aiken? I like to look at populations. Aiken is 30,000 people. See, that's a good that's a good size city to be looking in. So remember I said, so uh, primary market is 100,000 or more. Um, and then secondary mar secondary market is like twenty five thousand to uh, to a hundred thousand, 
and tertiary market is 25,000 or less. All right. And then you have like, then you have the sub tertiary market. I, I would say sub tertiary market is like 5,000 or less. And so like, you know, the sub uh, secondary market would be like maybe 25,000 to like, you know, 60,000 or 75,000 or something like that. All right. And so you can kind of just pick, you can kind of try to figure out what your market is. I started out with like sub tertiary market and then I went to tertiary market and then I moved up to secondary, sub secondary market. And then I moved to secondary market. And now we just bought something in Macon, which is a hundred and like a hundred and you know, 60,000 people, which we consider really a, a, a primary market, but really a sub primary market. I would call Macon a sub primary market. All right. So just think about that. And actually, you know, think about what level you're at, because you want to really focus like if you are if you only have so much money, then you can only afford so much, you know, so much storage facilities. Right. So much so much storage. So are you a sub tertiary market would be maybe like a population of five thousand or less. Are you a tertiary market would be like five thousand to twenty five thousand. Are you a uh, are you a sub secondary market, which is like twenty five thousand to maybe fifty thousand? I say twenty five thousand to fifty thousand is a good number. And then are you secondary market, which is like fifty thousand to a hundred thousand? And then are you sub primary market, which would be like a hundred to like maybe two hundred thousand? Or are you like a primary market where you're like two hundred thousand or more? Like I just want to be right in the middle. Right. And so put it into the chat, which one you think you are. I'd love to hear where you are now in terms of pricing. Right. So, you know, obviously, if you can't come up with any money, you're like, I ain't got no money, but I want to get into storage. Then you should be wholesaling self-storage. Right. I always say this wholesale self-storage. There's not enough wholesalers out there that know how to truly wholesale. So if you if you don't know how to wholesale, then you should definitely buy my course because I teach this. But essentially, wholesaling is really good for tertiary market. So your buyer is going to be a tertiary market buyer, sub tertiary and tertiary markets. And that is where you're going to find a property that's like a couple hundred thousand dollars that you can wholesale and make 25 to 50 grand on. All right. That's a good starting point. Sub, -ter sub tertiary and tertiary markets are like a couple hundred thousand dollars. All right. Five hundred thousand or less. Right. Because you can you can find like, an, you know, so if you can only come up with like 50 grand or, you know, if you can like have a 50 or 100 grand, then you would be like 50 grand is like a sub tertiary and 100 grand could be a tertiary to maybe a sub secondary. Right. And then you have like, and then you're like, I can only come, you know, I can come up with a hundred grand and my partner can come up with a hundred grand. So now you have 200 grand, right? And so now you have a million dollar property. Million dollars can get you um, like, you know, a good sub sec, like a sub secondary to a secondary market, something like this. All right. Now, every once in a while, you'll find like a bad deal in like a good city. Right. I mean, a bad storage facility, like a totally mismanaged storage facility in a bad city. Mismanaged facilities are like, you know, they're the they're the ones that are like the diamonds in the rough. Right. So, of course, you can always find these in all the different markets. Right. So, for instance, like I bought the ugliest storage facility in Macon. Right. And it's a population of one hundred and fifty thousand people. And I, I got the ugliest storage facility in Macon. OK, so you can you can always do this. There's always. You know, there's always like, you know, there's always like exceptions to the rule. OK, but typically you're going to find, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars is going to get you like a sub tertiary to a tertiary market. OK, so if you're trying to get your first facility and you're looking in, um, you know, you're looking in, you know, uh, Augusta for a facility that's like 300 grand. Well, that ain't going to work. That, that's gone are those days. That's like the days when I first started, like when nobody wanted to get in storage, like that, those are days, okay? You should be looking in, like, this is a great, you see how it's like Aiken, Williston, Blackfield, Denmark, Bamberg, Branchville. This would be a great corridor right here of like looking for storage, right? Like this would be a great corridor to be talking to every storage facility owner in this area. 
This would be a gray area. Okay. And, uh, you know, so think about like good areas that you could be looking at. And, uh, you know, you don't want to definitely don't want to be around the highway. But what about, you know, if you go up from Florence to Darlington and Hartsville? Now, obviously, like you could get into could like Bethune. And let's see, what's Bethune? Bethune is a uh, Bethune? Bethune? 315 people right so it's like that to be like a very small town even the smallest towns have storage all right so i bought i bought one of my very first facilities that i bought it was in a town of 315 uh people the the 10 mile radius was 6000 people and i bought it for $100,000 Okay. And it's 60 units and it's completely full. And I haven't been there in years. And there's one guy that just kind of mows the place and then like does uh, overlocks. You know, he'll, he'll like clean out and do overlocks. And I think we pay him like 300 bucks a month, but that thing is worth like at least 250 to $300,000. And we haven't done anything to it in like years. And honestly, you know, so there's nothing wrong with, you know, starting out in a sub tertiary market. There's nothing wrong with that. I'll be able to take that hundred to $150,000 and then just 1031 exchange that into like another deal. And then that hundred thousand I borrowed from the investor, he will let me just roll that into whatever deal that I buy. Okay. So there's nothing wrong with that at all. Now, um, so think about like the areas that you want to be in, you know, I, you know, it doesn't really matter what area, you know, and you just look, you know, you're looking for corridors and you're looking for, you know, uh, depending on how much you want to spend, but those corridors where it kind of comes out, you know, and then sometimes it's like, it's like super tertiary, right? Like Missouri is kind of a tertiary, like, except for around like the touristy areas and stuff. And for instance, like actually um, Arkansas is like, obviously like very tertiary, you know, there's a lot of country in Arkansas, you know, but there's some, a lot of really good area. I mean, this whole area from Little Rock all the way up to, you know, this area, I think this is a this is a very good area to invest in. And I would honestly consider most of this to be secondary market from Little Rock all the way up to Fayetteville. But then you have a lot of little tiny towns in here that because we're fine. I mean, believe me, because I have a I have a virtual assistant calling storage facility owners in these little tiny towns. And they're like, you know, even in these little tiny towns, I mean, facilities are anywhere from, you know, 250 to a to million dollars. I just talked to one lady and I think it was a town of like 30,000 people. And I mean, she wanted like $1.4 million. Okay. So, you know, if you don't have a lot of money, you should be looking in sub tertiary, tertiary, sub secondary markets. Does if that makes sense to you? So now there's like, I've just created these new levels of markets. And I don't know if I created them, but that's my idea. I came up with this, right? Sub tertiary is 5,000 or less. Tertiary is like 5,000 to 25,000. And depending on your state is what is going to determine the value of that like that market, I mean, of that facility. So depending on the market. So if you're living obviously in like Massachusetts, right? Where it's like the one, one of the most expensive places to live, obviously a, su a sub tertiary and a tertiary market is gonna cost way more than if you're like in Arkansas, okay? And uh, so, and then you have the sub primary and the, I'm sorry, the sub secondary and the secondary markets. And then you have like the sub primary and the primary. So maybe like, for instance, if you're in Nashville and all the suburbs of Nashville would be like sub primary, right? Or maybe there's a town in Tennessee that has like, it's a standalone town that has 150,000 people in it. And that could be like a sub primary town. So I wouldn't really actually call that a, a secondary town. I would call that like, because they'll have in a town of 150,000 people to 200,000 people, you will have just like you saw in Tallahassee, you'll have extra spaces in cube smarts. And really as like, as an investor, as a self-storage investor, you're thinking in terms of the way that these like big box office, I mean, they're doing what I'm telling you is what they are doing internally. They have like a whole team that does this, except for they focus on like primary and like maybe sub primary markets is what they focus on. And, uh, and where are the little people and we're focusing on like sub tertiary, tertiary and sub secondary and secondary, right? 
And right now there's that, that middle ground, right? So some of these like bigger players, like 10 federal storage, 10 federal storage love, like they're big in Atlanta. Like a couple of years ago, when I first got started, they were buying in Atlanta. And then they got pushed out of Atlanta because Atlanta got too expensive. So then they moved to Valdosta, right? And so you have this kind of movement. Obviously, the hedge funds can always always go wherever they want to go, right? But these secondary, these secondary players and then the tertiary players, and a lot of tertiary players, I mean, are like me. I mean, I own a lot of facilities in like tertiary, you know, sub-secondary and tertiary markets. And um, but there's a lot of movement right now. There's a lot of movement from like that, like up to down because prices are so expensive. But then there's movement like for people like me where I'm like, yeah, I can move on to the next level. Let me go buy something bigger, you know. And so there's all this movement and, you know, people are buying and selling storage facilities. I mean, there's so many storage facilities for sale. I just think it's like 700 storage facilities on Crexy right now. I've never seen that much. It's crazy. Like when I first got started, there was like 200. And um, so, you know, there's just so much movement right now that there's a lot of opportunity, but you really have to understand the market. You really have to understand the market. Okay. So that is today's lesson. Now, tomorrow, sorry, next week's lesson, Monday, we're going to take those tertiary, those, sorry, those markets that I just created, the six of them, and we're going to go through the cap rates. That's what we're going to do. So now you know all the different levels of all the different markets out there and how to find them. Your homework is to go and try to figure out which markets you're interested in. I would love to know. I saw some tertiary. uh, You know, I saw maybe wholesaling. Try to figure out what markets you're interested in. And then next Monday, we'll talk about like cap rates. What is the market cap rate for each one of those um, levels? Each one of those levels. Now, Ariel, and if you could please remind me, that's what my that's what my topic is for next week because I might forget. All right, so I am going to hop off now and go to my fund. It's a stacyrosetti.com slash fund. So make sure that you come hang out with me if you want to be a passive investor and just put your money into the um, into the fund. Okay, I appreciate. Uh, Ariel says, "What did you say for the topic? The topic is what's the cap rate of each of the six markets that I just went over. Okay. So we'll come up with a title for that, but that's what it's going to be. All right. I appreciate you guys hanging on to the end and I will see you guys at the next session. Take care. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Storage Nerds. Hope this informative conversation inspired you to go out there and jump into this highly profitable business venture that people rarely talk about. Get more tips on storage space investing at www.stacyrosetti.com. Don't forget to subscribe to the show and leave a rating. Together, let's build that thriving passive income one storage space at a time. Until next time.